are now living in a new normal. This COVID-19 pandemic marks as one of the global challenges experienced in this generation. It forces every sector of our society to innovate in order to move forward. We at the Industrial Technology Development Institute Technology is trying every possible ways to continue our service to our people without compromising the safety of each and everyone. in economic development and progress. The Balik Scientist Act or Republic by President Rodrigo Roa Duterte. This is actually uh, putting into law a program that uh, has been started by the Department of Science and Technology or uh, but uh, we need uh, some uh, legal support so that we can implement it in a uh, better way. And the Balik scientists will have an uh, easier time in terms of uh, coming here to the Philippines and rendering services. Who is the Balik scientist? experience and expertise of uh, uh, Filipinos uh, who have made good uh, practice of uh, being scientists abroad so that we can uh, they can share whatever they have uh, to uh, our own institutions uh, our own uh, researchers my role and responsibility of a public scientist is to be not just a teacher but also a pusher innovations within the program Balik scientists are given support by the government for their stay in the country and are likewise provided with a wide array of benefits to ensure their maximum output. The best incentives are having to be exposed with our farmers. My greatest privilege would be uh, doing collaborative work with uh, fellow Filipinos. The DOST, as the leading agency in charge of the Balik Scientist Program, is tasked to facilitate the placement of the Balik Scientist among its priority areas from its sub-agencies. P-Card PCHRD P-Shared
partnering with the DOST, private or public entities, providing the appropriate re the completion of their research activities and other tasks. I think the role of the institution is to give the space or the laboratory needed for the program or the project. Working together, the DOST, the Balik scientists, and the host institutions have proven the importance of collaboration and cooperation, critical of any nation's vision for success. I am a two-day webinar is part of the Virology and Vaccine Institute of the Philippines Education Program on virology and other related topics. This learning session is made possible by the scientist program. I am sure that everyone here is excited to learn, am I right? Just a reminder for our Zoom participants, kindly rename your Zoom account to this format, affiliation underscore full name. And also don't forget to mute your microphones and avoid interruptions during presentation proper. Now for this two-day webinar, we shall be learning a lot about the guidelines for research, synthetic nucleic acids, which will be discussed by a resource speaker, Dr. Elpidio Cesar B. Nadalia Jr., a Balik scientist from the Diagnostics for the Real World in the United States. There are a number of participants here in our Zoom meeting room, as well as our audiences from our Facebook and YouTube live streams. So right now, we have about 283 people in this uh, meeting room on Zoom, and we have seven in our uh, YouTube channel. Meanwhile, on Facebook, uh, let's check how many people are watching through Facebook Live. And 23 people are watching us through Facebook Live. All right, so before we start with our new topic, let's have a short recap of last week's webinar. So last week, we had Dr. Lourdes Nadala, our big scientist from the Diagnostics for the Real World Virology at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, and Final Technology at the University of Cambridge in Cambridge, United Kingdom. So a very uh, illustrious postdoctorate career. Dr. Nandala Jr. is a virologist and microbiologist with 20 years of experience in academic research and 17 years in the industry developing diagnostic assays for the detection of bacterial and viral pathogens. He co-founded Diagnostics for the Real World Limit, Hepatitis B virus surface antigen, Human Immunodeficiency Virus or HIV antibodies, and Hepatitis C virus antibodies, as well as improved versions of the CE Mark Chlamydia Rapid Test. From 2008 to 2018, he worked in the food and environmental testing industry, where he led a group of 17 PhD scientists and three technicians in R&D diagnostic kits and reagents for PCR and qPCR reagents and immunodiagnostic assays in order to test GMOs, antibiotics, allergens, and other adulterants in food and water. He then came back to the Diagnostics for Real World as Vice President of Research and developed in late 2018 with an initial task of improving the manufacturing quality control testing of the point of care SAMBA to HIV-1 test kits, which were already being used in Africa. Later, he developed the SAMBA-2 HDV assay. In February 2020, his team started the development of the SAMBA-2 SARS-CoV-2 test for the, te for the detection of SARS-CoV-2 RNA, which was developed and validated within two months. The SAMBA-2 SARS-CoV-2 test is now being used in 79 hospitals and schools in the UK, with a total of 648 assay models de deployed and 300,000 tests used so far. Dr. Nadala Jr.'s statement is to utilize the knowledge and experience he has acquired throughout his career in helping Filipino scientists and engineers who are working in the field of virology as well as diagnostics. Let's give a warm welcome to a, and a big virtual round of applause to Dr. Elpidio B. Cesar Nadala Jr. Dr. Nadala, the floor is yours. Okay. Let me share my screen.
Click on my own. Okay. Oh, good. You see my screen now? Yes, sir, we see your screen. Good, so I can start. Uh, yeah, just to uh, update you on the uh, SARS-CoV assay that uh, we are producing for the UK. We have over a million now tests uh, used by the UK and over a thousand of the instruments. Uh, but my talks, uh, Today, by the way, my talk will be on biosafety and biosecurity in the realm of dual-use research of concern. Uh, my talks two weeks ago on guidelines for research involving recombinant or synthetic nucleic acid molecules focused mostly on my own experiences rather than actual guidelines that are issued by government regulatory agencies, National Institutes of Health here in the United States. Uh, these guidelines detail safety practices and containment procedures for basic and clinical research involving recombinant and synthetic nucleic acid molecules, including creation and use of organisms and viruses containing recombinant or synthetic nucleic acid molecules. The topics for today and tomorrow will cover these safety practices and containment procedures and the roles of government agencies, research institutions, and principal investigators in biosafety and biosecurity. In the Philippines, biosafety concerns have largely been on GMOs and potentially harmful exotic species. Uh, with the establishment of the Virology and Vaccine Institute of the Philippines and the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, we are our attention towards biosafety and biosecurity when working with viruses and other microorganisms. When working with biological agents, a laboratory facility must have with these agents. So we will discuss biosecurity today and then biosafety tomorrow. You see the difference. Biosecurity refers to the principles, technologies, and practices that are implemented for the protection, control, and accountability of bio and all the equipment of research institutions that conduct research must establish review procedures and oversight requirements for life science research that are identified as dual. So government agencies and research institutions have assessed the risk that the knowledge, information, products, or technologies generated from life for harm. The responsibility by reminding all involved parties of the shared duty to uphold the integrity of science and prevent its misuse. In the Philippines, this government agency is the National Committee on Biosafety of the Philippines, DOST Under Secretary for R&D, and with members from the different departments, Department of Agriculture, Department of Environment, Mental Health, and res natural resources uh, in the uh, Department of Health. And uh, the NCBP, or the National Committee on Biosafety of the Philippines, uh, sometimes have the SPRP, which is a scientific and technical review panel to uh, review the proposals that deal with uh, research that 
has biosafety uh, considerations. Then you have the IBCs, Institutional uh, Biosafety Committees that are uh, in the various So the importance of the IRE or the institution, this is a critical include identity. Uh, the gene for botulinum toxin uh, is an exception uh, when in, and we ordered the gene from a gene synthesis company here in the States. They actually because of government regulation. So there are exceptions to this uh, first rule. Experiments, so these are modeling experiments, not actual bench stop wet experiments. Bioinformatics approaches when you're just doing, uh, for example, uh, when you try to figure out what's, what produces, you don't have to grow the agent to purify you can have of the of the age the protein structures from the the uh, nucleic acid sequence and then the amino acid sequence when you translate it. So currently there are artificial artificial intelligence that can do this, uh, predict very accurately the structure of a protein just from looking at the genome sequence or the sequence nucleic nucleic acid sequence of the gene for the protein. For example, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, the famous spike protein that's used for vaccines. Uh, and now because of artificial intelligence, they have been able to predict and have a very accurate structure for this protein and worked out that the Delta variant actually is different in the spike protein in that in that one amino acid substitution it allowed the spike protein to be a lot more uh, efficient or prime to bind and enter cells so that's why they are more transmissible anyway going back to my slide research related to the public animal or agricultural health impact of any of the listed agents. I'll show you the agents later on, sorry. Uh, we have to do this in sequence. So modeling the effects of a toxin or developing new methods to deliver a vaccine or developing surveillance mechanisms for a listed agent, meaning how do you uh, go and find the agent and, and surveil. Uh, these are all not included as DURC. So what are the 15 select agents? Okay, uh, I'm going to reveal them one by one or a few at a time. And I'm gonna go with the viruses first. So top on the list, the virus, high, highly pathogenic version. You've heard of H5N1, and I'll talk more in detail on this later on. The uh, viral hemorrhagic fever viruses from the filovirus family, Ebola virus, and Marburg virus. Foot and mouth disease virus, or hoof and mouth disease, more accurately, uh, an infectious and sometimes fatal viral disease affecting clothes. very prevalent also in the Philippines. Uh, and then reconstructed 1918 influenza virus. Uh, so you must have heard, uh, many of you must have heard about the 1918, 1919 influenza pandemic, which made almost 1 billion people, or at that time, half of the world's population ill or sick and killing from 21 to 40 million of them. SARS-CoV-2, by the way, so far has killed 4 million. And I think uh, over 200 million have been sick or have been positive. Influenza's destructive capacity resides 
in the pace and unpredictability of the evolution of this virus, which can subvert the body's immune response uh, and outstrip society's efforts at containment. So uh, at that time, large numbers of frightened, clinically, critically ill people overwhelmed healthcare providers. Sounds very familiar, isn't it? Mortuaries and cemeteries were severely strained by rapid accumulation of corpses of flu victims. So understanding of this outbreak's extent and effectiveness of containment measures was actually obscured by the swiftness of the disease in an inadequate health reporting system. So elements of an adequate response, including building capacity to care for mass casualties, providing emergency burials that respect social mores, properly characterizing the outbreak and earning public confidence in epidemic containment measures, protecting against social discrimination and fairly allocating health resources. These are all elements of an adequate response to a pandemic that we are currently experiencing. Sixth virus is rinderpest. This virus is of concern as a biological weapon. It was actually used as a biological weapon because of high rates of morbidity and mortality. But this is more on cattle, uh, uh, cattle herds. Uh, and uh, this virus has actually been eradicated next to smallpox. This is the second uh, virus that has been eradicated. So. It only, it only probably uh, only stored in some labs around the world, but it's not really uh, found anymore. Okay, now the variola major virus and the vari variola minor virus. These are the smallpox viruses and uh, so the variola major is the ordinary smallpox. Fatality rate is 30%. It's considered to be one of the most lethal of all potential biological weapons. Variola minor is a variant that causes a milder, a milder form of pox. And then, uh, the bacteria and other uh, agents, select agents. So we're done with the viruses. You notice uh, half or more than half, eight out of 15 actually are viruses of the select agents. Trasis, uh, we are all familiar with anthrax, um, botulinum neurotoxin in any quantity. Now I'm sure You've heard of this toxin being used as Botox for females who want thicker lips, get rid of wrinkles. Uh, so along with the Clostridium botulinum that actually produces this toxin, they are among the select agents. And then uh, Borcolderia species, uh, these are more on uh, uh, in World War I where they were used in biologic, uh, as a biological weapon, uh, mainly to kill horses, although it also affects people. Uh, and then uh, another bacteria, Francisella, that uh, causes tularemia. It's a pneumonic form, which is often lethal without treatment. And finally, uh, let's see. Yersinia pestis, the plague bacteria. So you've heard of plague in Europe before, wiped out a lot of the uh, people. Uh, actually, this bacteria is still around, but now we got antibiotics. So it's not really uh, doing the same kind of damage. So those are the 15 select agents. Uh, and now what are the seven categories of experimental effects. Uh, 
One, an experiment that enhances the harmful consequences of the agent or toxin. That means one of the 15 agents, select agents. Or an experiment where it disrupts the immunity or the effectiveness of an immunization against the agent or toxin without clinical or agricultural justification. So this kind of experiment uh, should not be carried out. Confers to the agent or toxic and or agriculturally useful prophylactic or therapeutic interventions against that agent or toxin or facilitates their ability to evade detection methodologies, diagnostics, for example, uh, increases stability, transmissibility, or ability to disseminate the agent or toxin. Fifth, experiment that alters the host range or tropism of the agent or toxin. So, for example, it used to be just in bats, but now you're making it uh, able to infect humans or other uh, animals. Uh, enhances the susceptibility of a host population to the agent or toxin. And, and last is it generates or reconstitutes an eradicated or extinct listed agent or toxin. Okay. So for example, smallpox and you want to experiment with smallpox and grow it up again that's DURC so let's go back to the highly pathogenic avian influenza number one in our list of 15 select agents uh, this is an example here in the US uh, in 2011 two studies funded by the National Institutes of Health which examined the mammalian transmissibility of highly pathogenic avian influenza. So basically, can the virus be transmitted from birds to mammals? This study raised concerns regarding the potential for a global pandemic due to accidental or intentional release of an engineered virus or misuse of the research information gleaned from the study. So to address these concerns, the US Department of Health and Human Services, which is a major funder of influenza research, has developed a framework for guiding health and human service funding decisions on individual proposals involving highly pathogenic avian influenza H5N1 research with specific attributes. So the framework aims to ensure a robust review of research proposals prior to making a funding decision that considers the scientific and public proposal, the biosafety and biosecurity risks associated with the proposal and the risk mitigation measures that are required. If you question in a manner that poses less risk than the proposed uh, approach, like in silico experiments. Biosafety risks to laboratory workers and public can be sufficiently mitigated and managed, research categories, but institutions have the discretion to consider other categories of research for DURC potential and may expand their internal oversight to other types of life science research as they deem appropriate. This is for biosecurity. So in fact, uh, with gene synthesis technologies, uh, they're becoming very powerful research tools and a virus can actually be made from scratch in the laboratory just through gene synthesis uh, without starting from an existent virus sample. So, Many biosecurity regulations uh, rely on regulating access to dangerous pathogens. So 
But if you don't need danger and synthesize it by gene synthesis, these have to be considered now. Guidance have to be issued uh, to help screen uh, gene synthesis orders, for example. Uh, if somebody orders the synthesis of uh, genes that will make up a whole virus, then that can be uh, a security issue. So, in, except uh, for other categories of bioterrorism or biosecurity agents or diseases, category A are the organisms that pose a risk to national security because they can be easily disseminated or transmitted from person to person, result in high mortality rates and have the potential for major public health impact might cause production and dissemination and potential for high morbidity and mortality rates and major health. So what are the agents or what are the agents that are in these different categories? For category A, there's anthrax, the plague, smallpox, viral hemorrhagic, hemorrhagic fevers. Notice that they're all included in the select agents because they are actually a threat to national security. Then you have category B, Brucella, Clostridium perfringens, the ricin toxin from castor beans, stuff, stuff with vocal intertoxin B, food safety threats, Salmonella E. coli, water safety threats, Vibrio, Cryptosporidium. Uh, again, we have mentioned the Borkelderia, the, uh, the two species that cause glanders and melioidosis in, in uh, primarily in horses. And then you have Chlamydia, uh, causes uh, cytokosis, uh, Coxiella causes pew fever, typhus fever from rickettsia, and the viral encephalitis viruses. Uh, these are all category B. Uh, of this, I have worked with Brucella, for example, uh, and we were basically making vaccines against uh, for Brucella and then making diagnostics. Uh, food safety, the Salmonella E. coli, these are routinely and Shigella uh, assayed for in food and water also, Vibrio, Crypto, Cyclospora. And then category C, uh, agents are emerging infectious diseases such as the Nipah virus and Hanta virus. Uh, so high fatality rate for Nipah virus also. Uh, so this can be uh, dual use research of concern. So uh, principal investigators, what is the role of a principal investigator in a research institution? They are required to, that his research, his or her research with none of the listed agents that also reasonably anticipated to produce one or more of the seven listed experimental effects may meet the definition of the URC be reconsidered or reconsidered by IRE. So the PI makes that determination and then submits it to the IRE. By the way, IRE, the institutional review entity, must be, will be composed of at least five members, be sufficiently empowered by the institution to ensure it can execute its oversight function have sufficient breadth of expertise to assess the dual use potential of the range of relevant life sciences research conducted at the given research facility. It should include persons with knowledge of relevant government policies and understanding of risk assessment and risk management considerations, including biosafety and biosecurity. This review entity may also include or have available as consultants, at least one person knowledgeable in the institution's commitments, policies and standard operating procedures. 
on a case by case basis, the mem uh, a member can be recused from the IRE who is involved in the research project in question or has a direct financial interest except provide requested by the IRE. And the IRE must engage in an ongoing dialogue with the principal investigator of the research in question when conducting risk and assessment and developing a risk mitigation plan. So the role of the IRE in DORC identification is they would verify that the research identified by the principal investigator directly utilizes non-attenuated forms of one or more of the listed agents. And they would review the PI's principal investigator's assessment of whether the research produces, aims to produce, or is reasonably anticipated to produce one or more of the listed experimental effects. And the final determination of whether the research meets the scope of the policy for institutional DURC oversight. So the ways uh, risk assessment of the URC by the IRE looks for the ways in which knowledge, information, technologies, or products from the research could be misused to harm public health and safety, agriculture, plants, and URC, uh, the misuse of the research. And then the uh, IRE would conduct a risk assessment and determine that the research meets the definition of, DUR, the, uh, of DURC. Then the IRE should assess the benefits while also considering the risks previously, develop a draft risk mitigation plan. So knowing the risk, how do you mitigate it? Minimize it. For the identified DURC, plans should be based on the assessment of the risks and benefits performed. And then review at least annually all active risk mitigation plans at the institution. If the research in question still constitutes DURC, the IRE should modify the plan as needed. So risk assessment, risk mitigation pose unique challenges. What are these challenges? Uh, when the IRE uh, does this. Risks can often be reduced, but are rarely eliminated. Assessing risks requires speculation on the ways that information derived from research may be misused. In order to determine the level of acceptable risk and the best mitigation strategy. Also important to identify the likely benefits of the research, which may not be apparent early on. A lot of things that we discover in science are not, do not have an obvious application. The individuals that constitute an IRE may be more accustomed to assessing the benefits of the scientific research than its risks. So these are the, some of the challenges. And what are the potential benefits of DORC and how do, you, uh, how do you look for that? Are there potential benefits to public health, public safety for the research? Are there potential benefits of the research for agriculture, plants, animals, environment? What potential solution does it offer to an identified problem or vulnerability? So, uh, are you developing a vaccine? Uh, so, and so what if you're gonna do a, an inactivated vaccine, you have to grow up the agent. And uh, so you have risks there, but you are trying to develop a vaccine. So that's a potential uh, benefit. What will this research be used, useful in the scientific public health or public safety communities? If so, how? Because science research, scientific research can have broad impacts, it is important to consider the scope of the potential benefits. Will the knowledge, information, or technology generated from research be broadly applicable? What populations of plants or animals might be positively affected? The benefit has been identified in what time frame? Immediate, near future, years from now, might this research benefit science, public health, agriculture, et cetera? 
So these are some of the guidelines for assessing uh, benefits of DORC. So could the information of concern be, so you have to weigh the risks now, you have to look at, okay, these are the risks and these are the benefits. Could the information of concern be more readily applied to improvements in surveillance or to the development of countermeasures than to malevolent applications? What reasons of evidence or evidence support the answer to this question? What is the time frame in which potential benefits might be realized? How might the potential benefits and anticipated risks be distributed across different populations, human beings, animals? And considering the anticipated risks in tandem with potential benefits, are the risks of such a feasibility and magnitude that they warrant proceeding after developing and implementing a risk mitigation plan? Are the potential benefits of significant magnitude to warrant proceeding despite the risks? And what is the most responsible way to proceed? For the vast majority of cases of dual use research of concern, an appropriate risk mitigation plan can be developed and effectively implemented. So institutions must put in place biosafety and physical security measures to avoid accidents or deliberate misuse of the agents. Okay, so uh, locks and highly secure facilities. The effective oversight of DRC is based on identifying and managing the risks associated with the potential that the information, technology or products generated by life sciences research harm public health, agriculture or national security. Risk mitigation is a process in which the risks are identified and assessed and then measures are put in place to address those risks. So IRE include their risk benefit assessment of DORC by developing a plan. The plan should indicate the DORC associated risks identified by the institutional review entity, the specific risk mitigation measures to be employed and how these measures address the identified risks. The IRE should consider the strategies outlined below to determine the most effective risk mitigation measures that are tailored specifically to the research in question. Number one, A, determine whether existing biosafety and biosecurity measures are adequate. Evaluate applicability of existing countermeasures. Develop a plan for responsibly communicating the findings of DORC. Again, this communication has to be secure. Don't do it at all. Uh, so I think uh, I don't want to go sp to specifics on each of these mitigation uh, measures because there are many. Uh, so for example, for determining that whether the existing biosafety, biosecurity measures are adequate. But uh, um, and then yeah, this is the educationing of the educa education of Tradition are, are uh, sufficient. So assess whether the research still produces, aims to produce, or can be reasonably anticipated to produce the steady experimental effect. So if it's still DURC, determine whether it still meets the definition of DURC, review, and as necessary, revise the risk mitigation plan. So that's the end of part one. Tomorrow we talk about by safety. Any questions? Thank you very much, Dr. Nadala. This uh, now for now our Q for Q and A. Anticipating a uh, weapons of mass destruction event or uh, using these organisms as uh, bioweapons. So uh, if you need to make uh, vaccines, for example, or if you, if you wanna counter uh, the, uh, the attack, then you need to have these. Uh, 
in the case of smallpox, it's a very complex virus. So uh, they will have a difficulty reconstructing it if they destroyed it and you just reconstruct it from the genome. It's one of the viruses that's harder to do that. Uh, you can do it with viruses like rinderpest, for example, uh, but not, not smallpox. So I assume that, that that would be the reason. Okay, thank you, Dr. Nadala. There is another question from Clarence Le Bautista of the UP Diliman. Can we withhold certain findings in the research in order to prevent it being possibly used for harmful purposes? Absolutely, and that's what biosecurity is all about. That uh, there are some information, knowledge, or results from experiments with the select agents and other uh, uh, agents, um, bioterrorism agents, that should not be released. Uh, and should be kept secure because they might be misused. Okay, very good. Um, another question from Ben Richard La Fuente. Do you sometimes combine some agents for a cure to find a vaccine? Can you repeat that? Uh, do you sometimes? Last year, the original year, uh, when it first came out, uh, because we, the, the whole genome sequence, the possibility that through evolution, they were quite positive that it wasn't constructed, that it was a natural uh, virus uh, and that it came from bats. If you look at the sequence, actually it's 90 something percent, 97 percent or so identical to uh, an already known virus in bats, uh, SARS virus. So uh, yes, you can find, you can look at it, uh, look at the sequence and probably tell with some certainty that it was constructed or it was not constructed. And I think uh, it's most likely not constructed but there's still the possibility that brought into the lab and then infected one of the technicians or scientists working on it. And then she went out and infected other people. But that's just one theory. Okay. I don't want to speculate beyond that. Okay, so we have uh, we have a comment from the uh, Saint Luke's Medical Center, uh, Saint Luke's Research and Biotechnology Group, and do research on influenza, dengue, chikungunya, rhinovirus, Zika, and uh, etc. I think this is in relation to the uh, question regarding uh, different uh, different institutions. So we have a question from Moses Sumawe of Suri College. Are all vaccines have the same reaction even though they come from different laboratories? So I think it's asking, do all vaccines have the same reaction? Uh, you mean the same? In, yeah, okay. Uh, uh, no, I mean, uh, the, you have different types of vaccine. Okay, so uh, an inactivated virus vaccine is very different from adenovirus vaccine and different from an mRNA vaccine, they would elicit a different population of antibodies. Let's just say that. So a vaccine that was inactivated would elicit a whole range of antibodies that react to different components of the virus, uh, plus the adjuvant if, if, uh, if there was any, but at least all of the proteins you find in the virus an adenovirus vaccine would now have some antibodies against the adenovirus itself, but also to the spike protein that, that's being made by, uh, in, in the adenovirus infected cells. And then for the mRNA vaccine, you only have spike proteins. So your antibodies are all directed against the spike proteins. So they're all working differently. Let's just say that. Okay, thank you for that. 
uh, answer, there is another question. Are viruses mutated from the original virus stronger? This is from Lisa Tita. Which virus again? Are viruses mutated from the original virus stronger? Oh, uh, when the virus, the virus always uh, undergoes mutation. Uh, most viruses mutate rather slowly, the DNA viruses. The RNA viruses mutate a little bit faster. And then, of course, HIV or flu mutate even faster. So they always mutate. Uh, but the ones that mutate to favor their maintenance and reproduction in the population, the host population, are the ones that uh, persist and survive. So in a way, yes, they always mutate. And yes, when they mutate, they always try to uh, be more efficient at what they're doing, which is infecting you and making more of themselves and then moving on to other hosts. Uh, the most efficient, uh, the most evolved viruses are so good that they can even stay with you and not kill you so that they survive a long time. Because if they kill off their hosts, eventually they're all, they're all begun. They need you as a host. Okay, uh, there is a question from Josh. What are the requirements needed to transport a category A, B, and C organism? Yeah, so next, uh, tomorrow, we'll talk about shipping out uh, these organisms. There, there's normally uh, primary, secondary, tertiary containers. Uh, if, if something is uh, a category two, for example. Uh, of course, if it's uh, category A, then uh, in fact, you might not even be able to transport it. You, have, you need uh, permits. So category B, you also need permits. Uh, if it's live, for example, brucella, you can't just ship live brucella. Okay. Uh, so yes, there are requirements different depending on the category. Of course, uh, e. coli, the, the 0157, you do have special requirements and you do need permits uh, in order to ship or receive them, uh, but they should be in uh, special containers with absorbent pad and with uh, sealing and an outer box. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nadala, for those um very insightful answers. Unfortunately, we cannot entertain all your questions today. I, I realize, we realize that you that you are very interested in asking all these questions. Uh, we don't have the time. We will address the questions uh, that we didn't address today tomorrow in our uh, session tomorrow. So uh, this concludes the first day of our two-day webinar. Please be reminded the evaluation form will be given tomorrow after the second day discussion. The evaluation form is required before you can secure a copy of the certificate and a copy of the presentations as well. Thank you very much, Dr. Nadala, all our distinguished guests, and of course, all of our participants for today. See you tomorrow, po. Same Zoom link, same Facebook page, same YouTube channel. This has been Bernard Gutierrez of DOSD ITDI. Good afternoon, everyone. Happy lunch, po, sa lahat. Thank you, Bernard. Thank you, po. Thank you, po. Bye -bye. Hey, don't talk. Tumitilaok na ang manok, hudyat na ng pagpasok. Paglilingkod na walang kapalit sa bayan ng aming hati. Tara na, kaibigan. Huwag kang magpaiwan Gamitin ang dunong bansa'y susulong Ating abutin ang pangarap niwan Sa pamamagitan ng agham Ang kaunang kakamtan Kung lahat magtutulungan Tara na Sama-sama Itaguyan ang siyensya
yung mga mo na'y haharapin Mahirap man ay kakayanin Sa pinagsamang lakas